So he was uh, uh, attorney general uh, in California during, the, during World War II. Uh, so you can perhaps uh, figure out where I'm going with that. And um, uh, he was also a presidential uh, uh, candidate in 1948 uh, on the Republican ticket. And then in 1952, uh, Dwight Eisenhower becomes president. And uh, he chooses Richard Nixon as his vice president. And uh, Eisenhower is a little bit concerned that um, Warren will be a force in the Republican Party in 1956 and perhaps run against him in a primary. In 1953, the Chief Justice of the United States, a man named Fred Vinson, and I'll get back to that story and it'll be quick, uh, dies. And uh, uh, Eisenhower nominates Earl Warren to become Chief Justice of the United States. So, in this case, if you don't know, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, and one person gets to uh, have the, the benefit of being the chief. Uh, that person has administrative capabilities, um, a little extra money, uh, and, and so, uh, but, but uh, as chief justice, you also have the uh, power, in some sense, to shape, and that's why we speak of the Warren Court. The current chief justice is a man named Roberts. We call this the Roberts Court. Um, uh, uh, before Roberts was Rehnquist, before Rehnquist was Berger, and before Berger was Warren. So we refer to courts by their chief justices usually, especially if they're powerful, and I think it's fair to say that Earl Warren was an enormously powerful Supreme Court justice. Um, let's just define some terms, uh, and this is going to get fairly complicated, and then I want to move on to the sort of the depth of all of this, the incorporation of the Bill of Rights. Um, we have, we, the United States Constitution uh, is a beautiful document, but it's rather short. Um, it doesn't say very much, and what it says is fairly ambiguous. And so the United States starts in 1789, and in 1791, between those two years, there's a drafting of the first 10 amendments of the United States Constitution. Those are referred to as the Bill of Rights. And they're pretty important, uh, I'm sure you're aware of them, um, but, uh, so I will go over that, but uh, the Warren Court incorporated amendments four, five, six, and eight between 1961 and 1969. So if you think about it, it's a fairly compressed period, um, which shows that Warren was both energetic and fairly powerful. Um, and so I will define these terms for you, but so the Bill of Rights refers to the first 10 amendments, uh, and what we're talking about, so the big ones, and just to go over them sort of in order, but the big ones are the first, um, which is speech, religion, right, the right to petition, the right to associate, and those are the big ones, and the Warren Court had um, not a lot to do with that. There was some important free speech cases during his term, um, but nothing, uh, we can say nothing sort of major, major. Um, forget the Second Amendment, it's about guns, it wasn't affected during Warren's time, the Third Amendment is a the quartering of troops, nobody knows about that, nobody cares. Uh, and then four, five, six, and eight. So seven is about on, on juries, and it's, it's important, but it's not that important. Uh, four, five, six, and eight are referred to as the criminal justice amendments, and so that's sort of where the, the focus of the talk will be. And just to go over what those are, um, the Fourth Amendment refers uh, to searches and seizures. Uh, the Fifth Amendment refers to due process. I'll get back to all of these things. Uh, the Sixth Amendment is your right to an attorney, the right to counsel, and the Eighth Amendment is cruel and unusual punishment. And cruel and unusual punishment usually refers to either capital punishment or prisons and prison sentences. So uh, the incorporation of the Bill of Rights is a rather complicated thing. Um, what happens is the first word of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution is the word Congress. Right? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The other amendments do not begin with the word Congress. I'm going to be quick because I want to get to the meaning of all of this, but in 1833, in a case called Barron versus Baltimore, as you can see, um, a man named Barron who had uh, property on, a, um, on, a, on a, a lake or sea or bay, I think it actually was, um, the city of Baltimore had interfered with his property. He lost some value to the property. He sues under the Fifth Amendment. Why the Fifth Amendment? Because the Fifth Amendment says that uh, the government has to protect life, liberty, and property with due process of law. Barron felt that he lost some property without due process. So he sues, case goes to the United States Supreme Court, he sues that he has a Fifth Amendment right to due process. And the Supreme Court in 1833 says, no, you do not. And the reason is, and so this is the important part about the meaning of the word incorporation. The reason is, they said, and the Supreme Court said, is that the Bill of Rights, all of them, not just the first, not just the fifth, but all of them, one, four, five, six, and eight, 
do not apply to citizens living in the states. They are only federal amendments. So had Barron been a, um, a federal tax collector, for example, and his life had been at stake, he could sue in a federal court or in the Supreme Court. But being a citizen of a state, he could not. That decision had enormous amount of uh, um, implications for civil rights for the rest of the 19th century and well into the 20th century. So this is what you have to understand, that by denying uh, any application of the Bill of Rights to citizens living in states, you could no longer say that the state of New York was rummaging through your papers in your home. Uh, you couldn't say that you had a right to remain silent in a criminal case. You couldn't say that you were being uh, poorly treated uh, in prison. None of those things actually apply to you, us, as citizens, at the federal level. You can only argue at the state level. All right, you understand? So in other words, we're in a period of what's called non-incorporation. So in 1833, the Supreme Court ruled uh, that uh, the Bill of Rights do not apply to citizens in the United States. And then something dramatic happens, and that's called the Civil War. And so after the Civil War, Congress passes three amendments, and they're very important, and the only one that matters to us is the second point following the Civil War, the passage of the 14th Amendment in uh, 1868. So the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. The 15th Amendment uh, protects the right to vote, particularly for blacks, but obviously for all people. And then the 14th Amendment, and so I'm just going to come back to this page, but um, the 14th Amendment says this. Now, so the 14th Amendment, if you look at the first three words, it seems to be what we would say is categorical. No state shall, right? So no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. And to be honest, forget that whole clause because it has no meaning constitutionally anymore. But apply no state shall, sorry, no, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that's just a repetition of the Fifth Amendment nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. When we talk about civil rights, when you talk about civil rights, when anybody mentions the concept of civil rights, they're referring to the 14th Amendments, those two last clauses, the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause. So now we can just go back for a second. One would think, students often do, citizens often do, that the categorical meaning of no state shall means that no state can after the passage of the 14th Amendment, ever interfere with what we would call a basic civil right. Where are our basic civil rights? Presumably in the Bill of Rights. So you would think that after 1868, if the state of New York has police officers coming into your home and stealing your papers, and assuming, and that's an incorrect assumption, assuming that New York doesn't have a law protecting your privacy in your home, you could not take your case in any way to a federal court or to a Supreme Court, or to the Supreme Court. All right, so you had no federal protection. And the problem here, and I'm just going to mention this and walk away from it, the problem here is that state court judges tended to side with sort of a pro-state understanding of things. And so that if a state or police did something that was a little bit dicey, um, judges very often didn't see a problem with that. So in that sense, we're living in an era after the Civil War, despite the clarity of the 14th Amendment, we're living in an era that is sort of uncertain regarding civil rights, right? And certainly if you know anything about the whole process of black civil rights following Reconstruction, it's a period of enormous violence, enormous uh, deprivation of, of basic civil liberties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, two quick cases. Uh, in 1873 and then in 1883, the Supreme Court rules in two separate cases. One case is called Slaughterhouse. And just for what it's worth, by the way, if you're interested in any of these cases, really a quick Google search will reveal exactly what they're about. So this case is called Slaughterhouse Cases. And the Civil Rights Cases in 1883, which is actually a fascinating uh, uh, case, and I really do recommend reading it. Um, but in both of those cases, the Supreme Court said that the 14th Amendment does not apply to citizens living in the states. Now, it's really a dramatic uh, uh, two cases because, again, the language of the 14th Amendment is, is categorical. No state shall really does mean that states cannot interfere in any way. So from the end of the, uh, from the beginning of the sort of the uh, uh, Reconstruction period, the end of the Civil War, all the way up through the end of the 19th century, and then all the way into the next century for the next 37 years, we could say that the notion of American civil rights remains purely at the state level. And so here, let me just say something before we get to Earl Warren. In general, and you'll see, so I'm gonna skip to the right, uh, there we go, so Jeff, all right, so, um, in general, 
the states do the things that matter most in the United States. The United States, and so I, I have this on another page, I'll just jump for a second. Um, federalism, <laughs> and then I'm gonna go back. Uh, the United States is a federal republic. The states do most of the work. Federalism is division of power between a central government and its constituent parts. In the United States, we call those states. In other countries, like in Canada, they call it provinces. It doesn't matter. In some sense, power is shared. In the United States, states do the bulk, historically and even today, states do the bulk of the work regarding everything from life to death. In other words, the federal government doesn't have a very strong hand in things like health, education, welfare, as well as you know, burials, as well as births. Uh, anything that, you know, criminal justice, always a state function, always a state function. So the United States is a federal republic, and then they put but, but Article 6 makes very clear that the laws of the United States are supreme over the states, okay? Nevertheless, the states do the bulk of the things that we care most about, and in this case, it's criminal justice. So I'm just going to go back now. That one slows down for some reason. There we go. All right, so with that understanding, you can see why the Supreme Court was reluctant in the late 19th century and all the way up to the first 30 so years of the 20th century to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. And there are sort of two reasons. One is an understandable reason. One is a little less understandable. The understandable reason is if the Supreme Court had applied the 14th Amendment to the states after 1868, you would need an administration of justice to do that. You would need a lot of federal judges. You would need a lot of federal courts. We didn't have that. Right? So, that's, so administratively, it would have been very difficult for the United States Supreme Court to say the Fourth Amendment applies to all citizens in the United States because then they would have been inundated with lawsuits. And there wasn't really an administrative um, body, federal courts, that could handle that kind of thing. The federal ju uh, judiciary didn't really grow until well until the 20th century. So that's one legitimate reason for saying that let the states do their their part, and uh, the federal government will do very little. The other reason is slightly less uh, enlightened. The, certain, the, the concern among uh, Supreme Court justices, federal judges in the late 19th century was that if they incorporated the Bill of Rights, two groups would petition more for rights than any other group. That would largely be uh, the poor, or we can simply say poor whites, and blacks in general. And there you can say that there was a deep concern that even if the federal government, if Supreme Court rather, had said that all the rights in the Bill of Rights apply to us as citizens immediately after 1868, would the states have enforced those laws? Right? That would have been a very difficult thing for certainly southern states were not about to start saying that all, you know, certainly blacks, but all people have the right to petition the court on Fourth Amendment grounds, on Fifth Amendment grounds. So for that reason alone, the Supreme Court was reluctant to incorporate the Bill of Rights to say nothing of administrative problems. So you can see what happens when, um, when Warren gets his hands on, on all the different amendments. Uh, all of these things will become uh, incorporated. Um, Map in 61, um, uh, Miranda in 66, Gideon in 63, and the Eighth Amendment in 1962. All right, so just before I get to the Japanese internment cases, um, something should be coming out, there it is. All right, uh, I mentioned that Earl Warren was Attorney General in California during uh, World War II. Earl Warren was the governor when, the, when Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, designating that all authorized military commanders designate military areas at their discretion, which was all over the West Coast, California, Washington, Oregon, and in fact we had, and it's, it's, it's a proper word to use, they're called concentration camps. We had concentration camps as far east if we're heading from west, if we're starting from the west as far as Texas, and as north to uh, uh, Wisconsin, maybe even Michigan, uh, there were concentration camps in the United States, largely for Japanese Americans. Um, Earl Warren was the man who um, uh, uh, enforced this order in California. So in 1944, the Supreme Court of the United States upholds the internment of all Japanese Americans in a case called Korematsu versus the United States. And Earl Warren wrote in his memoirs, he deeply regretted the removal order and my own testimony advocating it because it was not in keeping with our American concept of freedom and the rights of citizens. What's important about that is this, as we get to sort of the bulk of the actual lecture, when Warren became Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice in 1953, 
there was no doubt in anybody's mind that Warren was only thinking about Korematsu, that he was thinking deeply about his role in putting Japanese Americans, and these were Americans, into concentration camps or internment camps throughout World War II. So it seems to us that everything he did, the, and incorporation of the Bill of Rights is a radical idea, given that it didn't really start until 1961, so we have a, almost 100 years since the 14th Amendment, 1868, 91 years, um, that, that this quote from Warren seems to be the thing that sort of gave Warren his overall notions. All right, um, when Warren becomes Chief Justice, the following year, Brown versus Board is decided. So if we had to pick one case, I think that really summarizes Earl Warren's tenure. And again, we're, not, we're talking about criminal justice here today, but it would have to be Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, I assume you know something about it, and I don't really want to talk about it too much, but at least you get a real sense of how important uh, Earl Warren is to American civil rights and civil liberties once you understand that what Warren did was an amazing thing. Uh, uh, Brown v. Board is a 9-0 decision. Um, he really did corral all of the justices into um, uh, signing on to this case. The case obviously has enormous implications for the South, and it has enormous implications for something that I said. Really, for the first time, the Supreme Court told the states that they must do something under the 14th Amendment. And the states had to follow. And if you know anything about American public education, we're actually more segregated now than they were before 1954. Um, it tells you what kind of power the states have regarding things that local governments like most. Anyway, uh, Warren is most known for Brown, and it really is sort of his, his shining achievement. The, the decision itself is sort of poorly done, poorly drafted, poorly written in some sense, but uh, it is his shining achievement. Uh, other major achievements of Earl Warren's tenure, um, uh, prior to Baker versus Carr and Reynolds versus Simmons, we, have we all live in electoral districts, and today they're about somewhere between 500,000 and 600,000 persons in each electoral district. Prior to 1962, all electoral districts were completely haphazardly drawn. Um, some districts would have 500,000 people, some would have 200,000 people. Um, when you have that, power shifts to smaller districts. They have more power because they have more power in their vote. In 1962, 1963, and again in 1964, so Baker versus Carr through Reynolds versus Sims, uh, Earl Warren cleaned all of that up and he mandated, and this is one thing about Warren that I'll get back to, but he mandated that all electoral districts basically give one man one vote, and he mandated that all electoral districts in the United States, and not just he, it's through the Supreme Court and through a you know, civil suit, um, that all uh, districts in the United States are roughly equal, and so that's what they are today, and therefore you have in the sense of one man one vote. Obviously, what we're talking about today expanded the meaning of amendments four, five, six, and eight. Um, and then the critical thing is that these decisions expanded national power and largely restricted state power, the thing called federalism. And so what I want to say about that just before we get to um, uh, the incorporation cases is precisely that what Warren did was so dangerous in some sense. It was so controversial. And not every, you know, as much as we sort of like these cases, everybody sort of likes Map, everybody likes Miranda, as much as we like these cases, these cases are enormously controversial because they're not clearly found in the text of the Constitution. And so you do have to gain support for your opinions even as you make these opinions. Am I taking questions now or? Um Wait, okay, we're going to hold on a few minutes then, so yeah. put your hand. Right. All right, anyway, let me just sort of briefly run over other important and, and again, sort of radical quick uh, uh, cases done by Earl Warren. Another case toward the very end, 1967, a case called Loving versus Virginia, um, and this is a case that uh, benefits uh, someone named Barack Obama, uh, whose parents are uh, one black, one white. Uh, all southern states and some western states had laws prohibiting the marriage of blacks and whites. Uh, 1967, and it's a good name, Loving, about marriage. Not that marriage has anything to do with that. <laughs> um, but uh, 19, that was a joke, right? All right so uh, in 1967, uh, the Supreme Court, and again, it was Earl Warren, uh, ruled that any uh, state law that uh, prevents the marriage of uh, uh, people on the, on the notion of their race, blacks and whites uh, together, was a violation of, and there's that 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection of the Laws Clause of the 14th Amendment. All right, so a major case, you can see um, states were not very keen on, southern states were not keen on mixing uh, people uh, in schools. They certainly weren't keen on mixing people in terms of marriage either. And so uh, you have Loving versus Virginia. Another important case in 1962, uh, and this got Warren in some trouble, Angle versus Vital, um, unconstitutional for state officials to compose an official school prayer and encourage its recitation in public schools. This effectively banned prayer in schools. 
up until about the 1980s or early 1990s, uh, when it sort of has returned, but when I was growing up in Brooklyn, uh, we did not uh, say prayers in school at all. Uh, we also stopped saluting the flag, I remember, around, you know, somewhere in that sort of early 70s, late 60s kind of thing. Um, Abington School District versus Shemp, 1963, declared school-sponsored Bible reading in public schools to be unconstitutional. Now you can see, I mean, Warren, I mean, if you include, you have Brown, you have Loving, you have Angle, you have Abington, you have the incorporation cases. He's getting in a lot of trouble. People don't really like him anymore. Um, and then in 1965, a major case, uh, this case leads to uh, a famous case called Roe versus Wade. Uh, but in Griswold versus Connecticut, Connecticut, which was a heavily Catholic state, um, had a law banning the use of contraception even for married couples. Uh, and so according to Earl Warren and the Supreme Court, the Constitution protects a right to privacy. Now that word does not appear anywhere in the Constitution though no such phrase exists. The case involved a statute that prohibited any person from using any drug, medicinal article, or instrument for the purpose of preventing contraception. And the court created something called a right to marital privacy. And again, we could say a lot about all of this. I just sort of want you to understand the gist of all of it just so we can get to incorporation. But one of the major effects of this were posters all over the United States, in southern states, in western states, and there's another picture. Uh, this one is from Colorado. This one is from the South. Um, Save Our Republic, Impeach Earl Warren. There were major revolts against the Warren court by the middle of the 1960s, certainly almost by the end of the 1960s. The country was really almost apoplectic uh, about Earl Warren. He became the symbol of what we would call rampant liberalism. Um, and uh, 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 here comes the revolt. So. I'm not really going to get to that, but now at least let me get to sort of the bulk of what the, the talk is actually about. The period of full incorporation from 1961 to 1969, uh, and it doesn't happen chronologically, so what I want to do is at least go over some of these cases, not terribly in depth, but at least so that you get a, a decent understanding of all these things. What happened was by the end of the 1950s, Earl Warren told his law clerks that he wanted cases that would help him and a majority of the justices on the Supreme Court incorporate, apply the 14th Amendment's due process clause to the states and the amendments that were attached to them. So they began looking, literally looking for petitions from people dealing with four, five, you know, four, five, six, and eight. And so I can just sort of do that. Um, in 196, well, it happens a bit earlier, right? In the late 1950s, a woman named Dalry Mapp was suspected of having narcotics in her home. Uh, and there were supposed to be some bombs in the house. So the police come to the house, it's in Cleveland, Ohio, in the late 1950s. The police come to her home and they ask her if they might search the residence. Now, uh, one thing you may not know, but every state has laws that are very similar to the Bill of Rights anyway. So all state laws had protections for the police walking into your home and taking your property without a warrant, that kind of thing. But what happened though is that if they did that, it's possible a state court judge could uphold the search, even though it would seem to be illegal. And what you can't do is you cannot apply to a federal court, but if you apply to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would simply say that there's no application of the Fourth Amendment to you, and you would lose. So, in a sense, you know, we were sort of insecure. Anyway, the police come to her home, and they ask if, she can, if they can search the house. She calls her lawyer, and the lawyer says, ask for a warrant, and a police officer takes out a piece of paper, which either was blank or had some words on it, but it wasn't a warrant. Um, she grabbed it, interesting woman that she was, I guess. Um, she grabs it and she shoves it down her blouse. The police officer, this is sort of strange too, goes down her blouse <laughs> and tries to get it back. There's a struggle. The police somehow enter the house. Remember, this is late 1950s Ohio. And instead of finding a bomb and narcotics, they find pornography. And it was illegal to have pornography in your possession, so they arrest her on pornography charges. And this case goes up to the United States Supreme Court. And the court rules, and so here I'm just quoting, that evidence obtained in the search was inadmissible because it was seized in an illegal search. In ruling this way, the court created what was called the exclusionary rule that you know from law and order, I guess, right, which makes it illegal to obtain evidence that is later becomes inadmissible in court. The ruling upholds the principles of the Fourth Amendment. So not only does this case, and so for the first time, and again, given a sort of sketchy uh, uh, overall history uh, survey, given how difficult it was to apply any of the Bill of Rights, and one thing I didn't mention, by the way, is that the First Amendment was applied to the states back in 1925 and again in 1944. There's a general consensus in the United States that speech is sort of well accepted, but the criminal justice amendments 
pose problems. We don't like the idea that criminals go free. My students, I'm sure you as well, always say he got off on a technicality. I don't really like that phrase because that technicality is the Constitution. Um, but things like that appear to Americans to be technicalities, like exclusionary rules. But Warren does this to make a point that what had gone on for 100 years since the 14th Amendment and what had gone on for 60, 70 years before the 14th Amendment was no longer acceptable. So this really represents a major change in the way that we understand rights and the way that we understand the state and the, and the rights that the state is supposed to protect. So in Matt versus Ohio, not only do we get the incorporation of the Bill of Rights, uh, of the Fourth Amendment, through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, we also get something that, in some sense, uh, Warren makes up, which is the exclusionary rule. From this day forward, any uh, evidence obtained, which is called the fruit of, of, a, of a poison tree, any evidence that is obtained illegally by the police cannot be used against you in a court of law. So it's a major case. It really is a sort of radical, revolutionary understanding of it. There are prior cases, so if we want to talk about that, I'll just try to sort of keep short here. But we can mention uh, there were prior cases where the court had first tried to broach this topic and it didn't really work. Um, uh, but there is already a sense here of a right to privacy in your home and a right to, uh, not to have the police come into your home without a warrant. So that's more or less the Fourth Amendment. Um, the Eighth Amendment is uh, incorporated next. And I said the Eighth Amendment applies usually to capital punishment cases. So the key language of the Eighth Amendment is cruel and unusual punishments. And it also applies to prison sentences. No surprise to sometimes the prison behavior, if you will, for guards, if they beat the crap out of you or something like that, you could claim cruel and unusual punishment. You'll lose, but you can claim that. What's interesting about Robinson versus California is that in Robinson, California, it's not a capital punishment case at all. What it is, in fact, is a law in California that uh, made it illegal not only to possess drugs, but to be addicted to drugs. And the court said that that was cruel and unusual punishment because addiction is a medical or psychological, biological problem. It is not a willful desire on your part, so it is cruel and unusual punishment. So let me just say something about the Eighth Amendment in that regard. The Eighth Amendment clearly says cruel and unusual punishment. It doesn't say cruel or unusual punishment. So for punishment to, be, um, uh, to measure up to the Eighth Amendment, it has to be both cruel and unusual. So let me go back to an era when we did not incorporate the Bill of Rights. Uh, in 1890, there's a case called In Re Kemmler in regard to a man named Kemmler. Um, in the early, in the late 1880s, William Kemmler killed his wife, which was illegal in the state of New York. Um, <laughs> it's illegal everywhere, but it's illegal in the state of New York. And um, uh, his punishment, what happened was just prior to that, a man named Thomas Edison and a man named George Westinghouse had competed to create the electric chair. Um, uh, Edison was, uh, uh, Edison favored direct current and Westinghouse favored alternating current. And if you ever plugged anything into a, an outlet, you'll know that it's alternating current. Um, Westinghouse wins out and um, uh, has the idea that you can electrocute somebody in a chair uh, and you would kill them. So the electric chair never having been used was used first in New York State and first for William Kemmler. And Kemmler had a great argument. I mean, if you really think about the language of the 14th Amendment, it's very clear, no state shall blah, 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 deny to any person, life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And then you add the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. Kemmler said, look, not only is it cruel to kill me electrically, but it's unusual. It's never, and what does unusual mean? It's never been done before, right? That's what unusual means. The Supreme Court said, uh, no. They said, no, we're not applying the Eighth Amendment to the Fourteenth Amendment uh, in your particular case. So you see, that shuts down any attempt to uh, end capital punishment in the United States from 1890 to 1962. The United States Supreme Court doesn't end capital punishment until 1972, um, and then it overturns that just four years later, as you may know. Um, my larger point is it's very difficult to attack capital punishment because cruel and unusual really does have to mean both. And to be unusual, it would have to be freakishly unusual. Um, and to be cruel, it's hard to say what cruelty, even pain suffered during the execution process is not considered to be cruel. It's considered to be part of the process. So even Robinson, as much as it does, it incorporates the Eighth Amendment, it doesn't really push the envelope in terms of what cruel and unusual can actually mean. So I'm sort of, sort of summing up. Um, the next big case the Warren Court incorporates is Gideon versus Wainwright. And there, I know you can't see it, and I just couldn't find a better picture. Um, but in Gideon versus Wainwright, um, Clarence Gideon, um, he was like a 
two-time, you know, a little second story man, a little thief, basically broke into stores and, and robbed stuff like that. Um, despite the Sixth Amendment, which really sort of very clearly says everybody in a criminal trial has a right to an attorney, in the states, they didn't allow people to have attorneys unless they were going to serve extended periods of time in prison. So petty thievery would get you into jail, and jail is usually misdemeanors, zero to 12 months, and then prisons are longer than that. Um, Cla uh, I was going to say Clarence Thomas. Clarence Gideon, uh, after he uh, was arrested for breaking and entering, claimed that under the Sixth Amendment, and therefore the Fourteenth Amendment, he had a right to an attorney. Florida said, no, you don't. We don't grant attorneys for misdemeanor offenses. You're only going to serve about 12 months in jail anyway. So your life, your liberty, and your property are not deeply affected. And here, you should, you know, tear up. <laughs> Gideon did something rather amazing. This illiterate, unfortunate individual wrote his own petition to the United States Supreme Court. So I know it's, it's you know, it's a little faded, but I can tell you two things. He misspells the word Supreme Court. <laughs> And he misspells the nature of his petition, which is a habeas corpus petition. So, and then the rest, and I had it committed to memory, and I sort of, but it says something like, you know, may it please the court, I am asking uh, because I am a pauper for the right to an attorney. And it, it sort of bleeds with sentimentality about his condition and his inability. But what's interesting about it is he has a very strong desire, not just so much for liberty, but to be protected in his liberty, just to have somebody represent him because he could not do it himself. So Gideon versus Wainwright, you can find this petition, by the way, online, as I did, uh, maybe darker. Um, and we're jumping ahead. So uh, uh, anyway, when the Supreme Court gets this case, there had been a series of cases prior to that that had said that uh, the Sixth Amendment does not apply to citizens at all. With Gideon, the court finally had their case where they said that the Sixth Amendment applies to the states via the 14th Amendment's due process clause. And that gets us through three major cases um, uh, incorporated just by 1963. So I was jumping to the First Amendment. Um, and then finally, I don't know, let me just go through this for a second. These are all major cases that I'll just sort of mention when I get to them. Um, is there something after this? Or no, I don't remember. OK, yep. Yeah, so if we go four. That's five. So in, uh, right, so let me just go back and just sort of read to you from, uh, Oops, where do we go? There we go. So, right, so there are prior cases like Olmstead, which had to do with wiretapping. What you see wiretapping without a warrant is perfectly okay in 1928. Um, in 1961, wiretapping requires a warrant, um, but there was no application uh, of the uh, Fourth Amendment yet to all, uh, to all citizens. And then finally in Matt versus Ohio, right? And then so what we're up to is Miranda, actually, which is a Fifth Amendment case. Um, in 1969, Warren's actual last year on, on, on the bench, uh, he finally uh, overturned a case called uh, Palco versus um, uh, Connecticut, um, which is in 1937, uh, where he said that protections against double jeopardy are in fact protected under the Fifth Amendment. It was his last major incorporation case. Um, there are other Fifth Amendment cases dealing with self-incrimination, a very slow process. In Twining versus New Jersey, 1905, the court did not say self-incrimination was protected. In Adamson, they said that it was not in, uh, uh, protected. And then finally in Griffin, Malloy, and then Miranda versus Arizona, which is a case that everybody knows because you have a right to remain silent. The court finally got around to incorporating, and I think Miranda's 66, not 65. Um, the court finally got around to incorporating the Fifth Amendment. And so the Fifth Amendment's a bit confusing. It, it mentions due process. Uh, it mentions life, liberty, and property. Um, nowhere in it does it say that you have the right to remain silent. So let me just read to you. Erne uh, Ernesto Miranda, and this is a key point to summarize. None of these people in these criminal cases were particularly good people. <laughs> you know, They all did something a little bit nefarious. Um, but Warren understood these people not as sort of uh, um, criminals or just sort of bad people. He took them to be symbols of the basic notion that he had with Korematsu, a notion that everybody has the right to an attorney or to protections by the state in terms of search and seizures or lack of cr cruel and unusual punishment. And so Ernesto Miranda was arrested for kidnapping and rape of a young woman, really probably one of the worst cases in terms of incorporation. Upon arrest, Miranda was questioned for two hours. He never asked for a lawyer, and he eventually confessed to a crime. Later, however, a lawyer representing Miranda appealed the case to the Supreme Court, saying that Miranda's rights had been violated. And here, again, we can spend hours, but 
the notion of extorting confessions from individuals goes all the way back, certainly throughout the 19th century, but even before that, sweat boxes where, you, uh, where the defendant would sit for hours either in a hot room in a police station or in a cold room in a police station. Um, confessions were certainly extorted through lynching uh, or through the threat of lynching uh, in the late 19th century. Um, in a case just prior to this, in 1963, a case called Townsend versus Sane, uh, this man, Townsend, um, who was a drug addict, was given uh, what was called truth serum, and he confessed under the uh, uh, influence of this truth serum, and when he woke up, he woke up with a pen in his hand and a confession on the desk. He has no recollection of ever writing it. The Supreme Court threw that case out in 1963, and then by 1965, they were prepared to say that the Fifth Amendment applies to the states via the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, and not only did Warren do that, and here's my point about Warren's sort of radicalism, not only did he do that, but he came up with what we now call the Miranda warnings. You have the right to remain silent, you have a right to an attorney. So Miranda, by the way, not only incorporates five, it also incorporates part of six. You have a right to an attorney during the accusatorial stage of a, of a, um, uh, of a criminal uh, proceeding. Um, and at that moment, after that, 1966, we now have all of the crucial uh, 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 criminal justice amendments in the Bill of Rights applied to the states, right? Uh, four, five, six, and eight. Um, and that gets, so there's you know, six is gonna come up, um, assistance of counsel, uh, which you don't have, uh, in, so just to sort of go back a little bit on that, uh, in Sixth Amendment cases in 1932, a very famous case, Powell versus Alabama, that case is called the Scottsboro Boys case, you should have heard of it perhaps. Um, the court did say that you have a right to an attorney for capital cases, but not for everybody, and then you get to Gideon, which goes for all felony cases, and for uh, Argon Singer, uh, for um, imprisonable misdemeanors, um, speedy trial was incorporated in 1967, an impartial trial in 1968. So you, again, you can see what Warren is really doing. He's cleaning up his desk before he leaves. The right to confront witnesses in Pointer versus Texas in 1968. Um, and then I'm not going to go over Eighth Amendment again, although we can talk about that later. But uh, Trope versus Tullis is an important, oops, an important case for us. Um, and then that really sort of does our incorporation. Oops. That's the end? Okay. What am I having my First Amendment cases? <laughs> um, maybe it'll come up. Let me see. No? Anyway, so that, that sort of wraps up the whole notion of what the Warren Court was doing in terms of criminal justice. And then it's just worth mentioning that uh, the First Amendment, which Warren had very little to do with, but there were a series of cases in the late 50s dealing with pornography uh, that Warren sort of loosened, uh, but not completely shook until the 1970s. Uh, and then there were a series of national security cases dealing with uh, free speech and national security, which there the Warren Court was a bit more conservative. Um, in general, they didn't really do a lot in terms of what we now call civil liberties that happened in the 1960s. Um, and that, I would say, sort of wraps up our general notion of what the incorporation of the Bill of Rights is all about between 1961 and 1969. So thank you for your time. And, uh, have you ever been on jury duty? They never no. let me. They, they, don't, they don't let me either, but I was called a few years ago, and uh, so I sat in until they dismissed me. Um, but both of those cases were pretty serious, uh, 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 possession of drugs, distribution of drugs, and a gun. Um, and uh, both of those cases, even though I what, didn't, so there was ultimately no jury trial on those. And you're right. So 98% of all criminal trials, uh, criminal cases don't go to trial. They are plea bargained out. Um, I, I should tell you that uh, there is very good literature on the subject, including my former, uh, somebody who served on my dissertation, a guy named William Stunts, um, who thinks that uh, the Warren Court kind of created this mess, you know? Um, there are so many rights and so many rules and regulations regarding the privileges that we have in the criminal justice procedures that our system, that the system becomes slow and onerous and justice is not really done and the best way to get out of it is a plea bargain. Um, so you're right. Uh, uh, there may be a legacy and a connection between the Warren Court's incorporation and the movement to plea bargain. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, plea bargaining is a horrible thing if you think about the problem of justice. Why shouldn't a man who's accused of distributing cocaine on the streets uh, with a gun at least have his day in court, right? Um, on the other hand, 
you know, the other hand is that it assumes a certain amount of guilt. Look, you're guilty, so just plea out to two years, and then, you know, you'll serve, you know, a year and a half, and you're, you're gone. I mean, that's sort of, so there's something sort of disgusting about that. Everyone has a right to an attorney, and everybody has a right to a trial. And everybody has a right to prove their innocence, right? I mean, I think that's sort of what your point is. Um, you know, the Warren Court is not perfect. Uh, they did not... Uh, and, and Brown is sort of a classic problem. They did not see very far. They didn't see the radical implications of every w decision that they made. I agree with you. I think we benefit from the incorporation of the Bill of Rights. Um, uh, but in criminal justice cases, it created such a problem. And the problem is not simply the, the decisions themselves. The problem is the way the, the underfunding of public defenders, right, uh, uh, prosecutorial discretion, all of these things are major problems in terms of plea bargaining. Um, Sorry about that, but um, uh, yeah. But these are these. The, the, I think the consensus in, in constitutional law is that these are problems created in some sense by the Warren Court and its legacy, um, and that's something to, to think about and something to deal with uh, later on. So it's a good point. Yeah. Well, I'll just point out that in First Amendment cases, you can see the Warren Court had very little to do. All of it had been done before in 25, 31, 37, 40, 47, and then 63, a small case, uh, in 58, and, 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 uh, and then you see very little cases dealing with First Amendment cases. Their real focus was on criminal justice. Um, uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate you coming to all citizens, and then finally in Matt versus Ohio, right? And then so we're up to his Miranda, actually, which is a Fifth Amendment case. Um, in 1969, Warren's actual last year on, on, on the bench, uh, he finally uh, overturned a case called uh, Palco versus um, uh, Connecticut, um, which is in 1937, uh, where he said that protections against double jeopardy are, in fact, protected under the Fifth Amendment. It was his last major incorporation case. Um, there are other Fifth Amendment cases dealing with self-incrimination, a very slow process. In Twining versus New Jersey, 1905, the court did not say self-incrimination was protected. In Adamson, they said it was not uh, uh, protected. And then finally, in Griffin, Malloy, and then Miranda versus Arizona, which is a case that everybody knows because you have a right to remain silent. The court finally got around to incorporating, and I think Miranda's 66, not 65. Um, the court finally got around to incorporating the Fifth Amendment. And so the Fifth Amendment's a bit confusing. It, it mentions due process. Uh, it mentions life, liberty, and property. Um, nowhere in it does it say that you have the right to remain silent. So let me just read to you. Erne er Ernesto Miranda, and this is a key point to summarize. None of these people in these criminal cases were particularly good people. <laughs> you know, They all did something a little bit nefarious. Um, but Warren understood these people not as sort of uh, um, criminals or just sort of bad people. He took them to be symbols of the basic notion that he had with Korematsu, a notion that everybody has the right to an attorney or to protections by the state in terms of search and seizures or a lack of cr cruel and unusual punishment. And so Ernesto Miranda was arrested for kidnapping and rape of a young woman, really probably one of the worst cases in terms of incorporation. Upon arrest, Miranda was questioned for two hours. He never asked for a lawyer, and he eventually confessed to a crime. Later, however, a lawyer representing Miranda appeal the case to the Supreme Court, saying that Miranda's rights have been violated. And here, again, we can spend hours, but the notion of extorting confessions from individuals goes all the way back, certainly throughout the 19th century, but even before that, sweat boxes where, you, uh, where the defendant would sit for hours, either in a hot room in a police station or in a cold room in a police station. Um, confessions were certainly extorted through lynching uh, or through the threat of lynching uh, in the late 19th century. Um, in a case just prior to this, in 1963, a case called Townsend versus Sane, uh, this man, Townsend, um, who was a drug addict, was given uh, what was called truth serum, and he confessed under the uh, uh, influence of this truth serum, and when he woke up, he woke up with a pen in his hand and a confession on the desk. He has no recollection of ever writing it. The Supreme Court threw that case out in 1963, and then by 1965, they were prepared to say that the Fifth Amendment applies to the states via the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, and not only did Warren do that, and here's my point about Warren's sort of radicalism, not only did he do that, but he came up with what we now call the Miranda warnings. You have the right to remain silent. You have a right to an attorney. So Miranda, by the way, not only incorporates five, it also incorporates part of six. You have a right to an attorney during the accusatorial stage of a, of a, um, uh, of a criminal uh, proceeding. Um, and at that moment, after that, 1966, we now have all of the crucial uh, 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 criminal justice amendments in the Bill of Rights applied to the states, right, uh, four, five, six, and eight, 
Um, and that gets, so there's no six is going to come up, um, assistance of counsel, uh, which you don't have. Uh, a, so just to sort of go back a little bit on that, uh, in Sixth Amendment cases in 1932, a very famous case, Powell versus Alabama, that case is called the Scottsboro Boys case. You should have heard of it, perhaps. Um, the court did say that you have a right to an attorney for capital cases, but not for everybody. And then you get to Gideon, which goes for all felony cases, and for uh, Argan Singer, uh, for um, imprisonable misdemeanors. Um, speedy trial was incorporated in 1967, an impartial trial in 1968. So you, again, you can see what Warren is really doing. He's cleaning up his desk before he leaves. The right to confront witnesses in Pointer versus Texas in 1968. Um, and then I'm not going to go over Eighth Amendment again, although we can talk about that later. But uh, Trope versus Tullis is an important, oops, an important case for us. Um, and then that really sort of does our incorporation. Oops. That's the end? Okay. What am I having to my First Amendment cases? <laughs> um, maybe it'll come up. Let me see. No? Anyway, so that, that sort of wraps up the whole notion of what the Warren Court was doing in terms of criminal justice. And then it's just worth mentioning that uh, the First Amendment, which Warren had very little to do with, but there were a series of cases in the late 50s dealing with pornography uh, that Warren sort of loosened, uh, but not completely shook until the 1970s. Uh, and then there were a series of national security cases dealing with uh, free speech and national security, which there the Warren Court was a bit more conservative. Um, in general, they didn't really do a lot in terms of what we now call civil liberties. That happened in the 1960s. Um, and that, I would say, sort of wraps up our general notion of what the incorporation of the Bill of Rights is all about between 1961 and 1969. So thank you for your time. And uh, here's the First Amendment. So I'll go over that if you wish. Um, I'll take some questions. I know time is a little bit. Uh... I'll be real quick. There was a case where Justice Warren mm -hmm. ruled that two shoe companies who wanted to merge into one shoe company, okay. what they were doing was unconstitutional. I don't know that case. Well, well there was this case. Okay. You know, it caused a bit of an uproar. Why is that? Warren was basically telling some shoe companies what they could and could not do mm -hmm. because he thought that if these shoe companies merged into one, yeah. The monopoly, even though the shoe company's profit was pretty low. Yeah. So I just um, find that a little overstepping. Like uh, Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. I don't know that case at all. And the other thing is, the Supreme Court doesn't usually deal with monopoly cases like that. So I, 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 I understand that, but I, I, I can't imagine the Supreme Court dealing with a case of two small companies merging for a monopoly. That's not usually the sort of the, the kind of cases the court takes. But I'm not going to deny that it didn't happen somewhere in the early days of the 1950s or what have you. So, but I don't know that case. So, um, anyway, just. Uh, to see. Just a reflection. Sure. Um, it sounds like a, a lot of the Warren uh, decisions represented an advancement for justice. <laughs> but what we're left with right now is that with all the rights and all the recourse, about 98% of the criminal cases are right. plea bargains. That's right. So much pressure placed on the Senate to take place. That's right. That's a really great point. Uh, have you ever been on jury duty? They never no. let me. They, they, don't, yeah, they don't let me either, but I was called a few years ago, and uh, so I sat in until they dismissed me. Um, but both of those cases were pretty serious, uh, d uh, possession of drugs, distribution of drugs, and a gun. Um, and uh, both of those cases, even though I didn't, there was ultimately no jury trial on those. And you're right. So 98% of all criminal trials, uh, criminal cases don't go to trial. They are plea bargained out. Um, I, I should tell you that uh, there is very good literature on the subject, including my former, uh, somebody who served on my dissertation, a guy named William Stunts, um, who thinks that uh, the Warren Court kind of created this mess, you know? Um, there are so many rights and so many rules and regulations regarding the privileges that we have in the criminal justice procedures that, or system, that the system becomes slow and onerous. And 